Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader. Our guest today is Philip Ball, author of Beautiful Experiments, an illustrated history of experimental science. It's published by the University of Chicago Press. It was released late last year. Philip is the editor of the journal Nature, has been for over 20 years, and is a regular contributor to the Prospect Magazine. He has written for the New York Times, the Guardian, um, New Statesman, and the Financial Times, and many others. And he appears regularly on radio and TV. And you should check out his YouTube videos on everything from quantum mechanics and my favorite person in the world, Richard Feynman, um, and to his controversial views on the extended evolutionary synthesis, which we will not get into today. <laughs> but um, his books include, and there's so many, let me just give you a few of the fascinating recent ones. Beyond Weird, How to Grow a Human, The Beauty of Chemistry, The Elements, The Book of Minds. And by the way, Philip will be speaking live at a program hosted by the How To Academy next Tuesday. I guess the 13th at 6 p.m. And you can get tickets to the event at howtoacademy.com. But the book we're talking about today, Beautiful Experiments, at least to me, is a bit of a departure in a couple of ways. In the past few years, I've had the privilege of interviewing authors like David Chalmers, Michael Graziano, Frank Wilczek, Philip Goff, Donald Hoffman, Chris Ferry. And so why do I mention that? Because my talk with these great minds were basically about thought experiments that were non-falsifiable. That is, they could neither be proved or disproved. Everything generally went back to Descartes and then forward to the same problem from solipsism to the multiverse, the simulation hypothesis, the brain in a vat, the zombie argument string theory. So it's refreshing today that we'll be dealing with what has been proved. And as the title of the book declares, what has been proven by beautiful experiments. The other, world in the, the other word and the title that is important is illustrated, because on pretty much every page there are diagrams, illustrations, sidebars, but to me most importantly, photographs of the very men and women and their apparatus used to create this admixture of beauty and science. So welcome, Philip. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure. Well, so for some, if not most readers, as we said earlier before we began, the combination and meaning of the word beautiful and experiment may engender in some of my patrons confusion and wonder. So how do the two, I guess, interlace? And why are they so boldly proclaimed on the cover of this, in fact, also um, beautiful book? Yeah, um, it's a good question. And I suspect that for many of us, if we did any kind of experimental science at school, you know, it was probably a very messy affair. It certainly didn't feel be beautiful at the time. Um, but scientists themselves often talk about beautiful experiments. You'll hear them informally talking about that all the time. You know, so-and-so has just done this really beautiful experiment. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, what do they mean uh, by that? What is their notion of beauty? Um, because it's it, it sounds at face value that it's going to be a world away from what we mean if we're talking about a beautiful piece of music or a beautiful work of art. To some extent, um, the, the, the question is, is, is really, are, you know, are they talking about the same thing? Is there this, that same kind of aesthetic appreciation? And one can argue that there is, that actually deep down, the beauty that scientists are finding in particular experiments is perhaps coming from the same impulse as, you know, what we find beautiful in, in, in a work of art. Um, and that can mean many things. Um, but I think on the whole, what it means is in the, it, for an experiment, it means that there is a coming together of the ideas that you're testing and the way you have chosen to test them, not just the um, the the kind of concept of the experiment, but actually sometimes the apparatus itself that has been designed in such a way that you've really kind of constrained nature to give you an answer, to give you a clear answer. The best experiments on the whole are ones that ask a very clear question. And you've, you've planned the experiment in such a way that the answer you get is going to be unambiguous. 
that's the ideal in science. It, it doesn't often happen, one has to say, you know, that often science is this messy business. You do an experiment and you think, what just happened? How do I make sense of this stuff that, you know, maybe it's totally what I didn't expect? That's often the way science works and we kind of you know muddle through the best we can but there are experiments that have been done throughout the course of uh, the history of science where the the answer is just kind of unquestionable the uh, the, the the answer the, the experiment gives you makes you think aha it's clear this is the way the world works that's what every scientist dreams of and when they see it happen it's something that they respond to aesthetically in interlude three, and I'll talk about what the interludes are in this book, you actually do, in a couple of pages, do define what we've just spoken about. But what it reminded me of was, and I'm paraphrasing Keats, uh, Keats, uh, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, and that's all you need to know. And I thought, well, well, that's what an experiment does, it discovers the truth. And what's the predicate for that? Does it have to be, well, you talked about messiness, but like Einstein and Feynman both said, you know, and, and whenever any of the scientists said, what a beautiful, they get so excited. They get so excited that it's beautiful and it's right. There's just something about that is like, it's the enthusiasm to me in which they say those things that really gets to me. I think that's, that's an aspect of science that we don't often hear about because, you know, right. scientists are encouraged to present their works in this very kind of antiseptic way. You boil down, you know, all this work that you've done, all this laboratory work, all this thinking, you boil it down into what is often a very sort of dry presentation in the paper that you publish. And that's the, the kind of style that you're meant to look for. And it's often presented very impersonally. And it always seems to me a shame that in that process, we lose the, the, that real enthusiasm that you've talked about, that real joy often that scientists have when they're doing the work. Um, so that's really what I, you know, something of, of what I wanted to, to convey here. Whether or not the result of that is something that is true is actually a more complicated question. And that's something that I wanted to, to probe really, to, 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 to look at throughout this book, that um, you know, our notions of what is true, of course, change throughout time. That's the nature of science. Every truth in science is provisional. It's it's true because it's what we believe to be the case at that time. But someone can come along later with a better experiment or a different experiment and show that actually we've been looking at it the wrong way. So, you know, whether by doing a beautiful experiment, you find out something that is an eternal truth um, is is very unclear. And in fact, probably most scientists would say, well, it, you know, we can't assume that at all because of this provisional nature of what we're doing. But it, uh, what, what you do hope to find is a clear answer that makes sense, that allows you to have an advance in understanding based on what we currently believe to be the case about the, about the universe. One of the things I noted, well, as soon as you open the book, and, and for some reason, I'm, I don't mean the it's not as a compliment. It's just that the table of contents in this book is beautiful because it's very simple and it is essentially uh, six chapters, each one asking a question. They're bookended, no pun intended, by two hows, and between them are, are four whats. There are no whos, there are no whys, there are no wheres, there are no whens, and, which is interesting. And in addition, there's five interludes that kind of provide a break between the chapters. But just as in music, they're an offer to the reader of reflection and insight. And I, I actually say they're, they're quite lovely. And the, interview, the interludes really do connect. But at the same time, it happened to me. It, it gives you pause. And, and you wait a second or a minute or an hour before you go to the next chapter. How did you decide... The table of contents is really good. How did you decide to do it that way? I'm, that, that's, that's a compliment I haven't often heard. Um, that's very nice to, to, to hear. I think it, um, there are a couple of things. It would have been possible to have simply done a book like this chronologically, to have compiled a list of you know, yeah. 60 or so experiments that are often regarded as beautiful and just list them in, in chronological order. Um, that 
to, uh, what I really wanted to do instead was to was to group them thematically so that they're, they're kind of chronological within each theme because you because I wanted to show the progression of thinking that the experiments had provoked within each of those themes. But the idea of of, of making them questions rather than simply dates or personalities or so on is because that's what experiments are that you know again the best experiments are ones that pose a clear question that's all, that, that's one of, one of the biggest criticisms that is sometimes made of a piece of science is you know it's not clear what you're you're asking here it's not clear what your hypothesis is so a good experiment has to have a good question to begin with um, so you know that 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 seemed to be the the obvious way to uh, to to organise the material that they are questions really questions about about the world questions that include not just what, why is the world the way it is but also questions like what can we make how can we assemble atoms into new forms that we don't find in nature so there there are questions but I also wanted to uh, to make it clear along the way that what we think of an exp of as an experiment has changed throughout time um if we're going back to thinking about the experiments that were done in ancient greece say and i have one or two examples of that it's not the same concept of experiment as we have today and it's important to acknowledge that and also to show as i mentioned that actually the whole notion of experimental science isn't as straightforward as we think often scientists themselves will say well you come up with a hypothesis and then you test it and either you find that it's right or it's wrong but the hypothesis itself has to be based on on some theory it has to be based on some view of how you think the world is and how you interpret the experimental results will depend on that view that you already have about how the world is so there are some experiments in here that you know they were they were lovely experiments they seem to give a clear answer but actually later on we found the, the whole basis on which the experiment was predicated wasn't quite the right one or wasn't the one that we now believe in. And so, you know, the what seemed to be a true result of that experiment now seems to us to be, oh, things aren't actually that way. That doesn't undermine the beauty and the value of the experiment. It just shows this is this is just how science works. And the illustrations are so helpful because, you know, you have some of these apparatus that are really quite wonky with wood and things hanging off of them and nothing precise. And they have to worry about the street noise at night and the breezes in the laboratory. And then there's some that are magnificent. But if we start at the beginning, which is the first chapter, where is how does the world work? And we start with the first experiment, which is almost a thought experiment. And then there's no apparatus. It's Erasthenes. How big is the world? And it's not so much the beauty to me is he was so close <laughs> to being right. How the hell did he do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is amazing. I mean, you know, opinion varies about exactly what figure he came up with, because it depends on how you convert, you know, the ancient units that we use in ancient Greece to, to the ones today. But either way, it's clear that the answer he came up with was pretty good, was pretty close to, you know, what we now think as the uh, the, the the size of the world. Some people might question whether that was really an experiment at all, because it didn't really have any apparatus. It it, it consisted of looking at the, uh, the the length of the shadows that are made by the sun at a certain time of year when you stick a pole into the ground at different locations on the Earth. Um, but it, I think it, it, it does qualify as experimental science because it wasn't an answer. The, the answer he, he got, the measurement he, he made, couldn't have been done by any amount of thinking. It was only by looking and observing and measuring that you could come up with that answer. And those are the crucial aspects of experimental science. Whether or not you have some fancy apparatus, um, it's about measurement and observing. So, you know, you have to go out into the world and ask it for an answer rather than looking inside yourself to try to find that answer with logic. That's really the key to experimental science. And I, I, I was very glad to be able to do this as a highly illustrated book, because for me, the apparatus itself is a huge part of the appeal of experimental science, whether it's something gigantic and, you know, incredibly engineered like the Large Hadron Collider at CERN um, in Geneva, where they do these particle smashing experiments, or whether it's something 
totally handmade and cobbled together by what bits and pieces the scientist had available, as often Michael Faraday was doing at the start of the 19th century, or even Ernest Rutherford was doing at the start of the 20th century to investigate the, the nuclear atom. Um, whether, you know, at either ends of that scale of how sophisticated the equipment is, it is the kit itself. It's the actual physical stuff that I, that I find incredibly appealing. You know, how we figure out how to put things together that are going to tell us something about the world that we didn't know before. So, well, the second one like that is, depending on how apocryphal it actually is, is Archimedes given this task by a king with regard to the percentage of gold and he sits in the bathtub and he goes, oh, I'm not going to say a curse word, but he goes, holy, <laughs> he goes, Eureka, and runs naked through the streets. And the point of that is just like, Einstein taking a walk and thinking, or when he was 12 years old, thinking, I wonder if I could ride on a light beam. There's no apparatus there. It's just as I had my dream last night, it's just all in here. And so that thought had to wait until science was advanced enough that Eddington could go and look at an eclipse on a cloudy day. Yeah, the, the, I have a, one of the interludes in, in the book is about thought experiments. I felt I had to, you know, address that because they are so popular and, and so powerful um, in science and in philosophy. Um, so these are experiments that are, you know, you, you purely, purely done in the mind. You think, hey, what if I could do this? What would be the consequences? And that's absolutely what Einstein did to come up with the, the theory of, of special relativity. And he, and he had a similar thought experiment about falling uh, about a lift falling uh sort of free falling if you cut the uh the cord that was holding the lift up and it was just falling down what would it be like inside there and that's what led him to the theory of general relativity the theory of gravitation um and what's what what's great about uh, some of these thought experiments is that they do they can become real experiments there were lots of thought experiments in the early days of quantum mechanics because it was very hard to do the uh, the actual experiments that today we're able to do and actually put to the test and see whether the thinking um, gave the right answer or whether you know the universe gives us a different answer so thought experiments have always been important in science but you know most scientists would say well ultimately you have to do you actually have to do the physical experiment that's the only way that you're going to find out whether your thinking is is correct or not well You've explored this in some of your other books, but when I began by talking about, I love talking to these guys, but when they talk about solipsism and kind of give it up because that would screw up their entire life <laughs> um, or my life, either one, um, or the multiverse and they talk about the matrix and they talk about everything everywhere all at once, they always go back to movies. But if they talk about the multiverse or simulation or string theory, this is a good one. Does that I'm not saying it this way. Does that make you angry? I don't mean angry, but it's like these are posits that at least right now cannot possibly be proven because for the most part, they lie outside the ambit of anything that we can conceive of, like Gödel's theory of incompleteness or Turing's machine that ha would have to be bigger than the universe in order to work. Yeah. How do you feel all that stuff? Yeah, well, it's a it's a very good question because this is um uh, this is an argument that's happening in science at the moment of you know wh the, the whether this gold standard of unless it's testable unless you can actually do a physical experiment to test your ideas they're not real science this is something that's being actively debated at the moment for precisely these reasons that there are some areas particularly at the cutting edge of physics where it's not possible to test the theories that are being put forward. And uh, and the question is, you know, are they properly scientific theories, if, if that's the case? I guess I feel science, it, it's fine for science to work this way. It's fine for our theories sometimes to have to go beyond what we can physically test. It wasn't immediately clear how you would test the theory of general relativity. I mean, amazingly, it was tested within about three years of it being put forward. We figured out, oh, actually, if that means that light gets bent by heavy objects like stars, you know, they, they we can test it during an eclipse. Um, so, you know, that was that was kind of an ingenious way. But sometimes it's not at all clear how um, these ideas can be tested. 
I think that's OK, as long as we remember that in that case, what is being put forward is speculative and, you know, no one can claim it as the way things are. So I guess what does sometimes get sometimes annoy me is when, for example, someone who believes in the many worlds theory of uh, quantum mechanics says, well, it has to be this way. This is, you know, th th there is no other way that quantum mechanics can be. We just, you know, we just have to uh, assume that those other worlds are out there. And someone says, well, show me an experiment that will that will prove this. And there isn't such an experiment and no one knows how to do one. So, I, you know, I think it's fine to put that forward as a hypothesis, as an interpretation amongst others. But so long as no one is going to claim this is how things are, because I, I guess I do feel that experimental science is the only way that we can really pronounce with confidence on that question. You bring that, you know, we both really like Richard Feynman. And you, there's two things I, I thought about with with regard that, to that in the book. He talks about if you have a beautiful hypothesis and things don't quite work out, then you just tur turn a knob this way, like my dream last night, and you turn a knob that way, and then it works, but your experiment is totally worthless. <laughs> but it's still beautiful. <laughs> Well, you know, Feynman had a, said, said a, a controversial thing, although it's often not seen that way about experiments. You know, that he said um, uh, something, words to the effect that, you know, your your theory can be as beautiful as you like. But if it if it conflicts with experiment, tough, you've got to throw out your beautiful theory. Um, and there's this famous quote from another physicist about uh, a, a, a beautiful idea being slain by an ugly result. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's there's clearly a, a, a lot in that, in that, you know, if your theory is found time and time again to conflict with experiment, then there's something you've got to conclude there's something wrong with the theory. But I think that Feynman's way of putting it sometimes is too simplistic a way of, of thinking about it, because, you know, experiments don't always tell us, um, don't always give us the right result, the correct result, because experiments can be flawed. There may be some factor that you haven't taken account of in your experiment that is that is causing your results to be skewed or to be wrong. In fact, that happens time and time again in experimental science. And so there are absolutely times when an experiment seems to conflict with theory, and yet it's the right thing to do to say, you know what, I'm going to stick with this theory for the time being. I'm going to continue Continue testing it. I'm not going to chuck it out at the first sign of a conflict with experiment because experiments aren't always the the arbiter. Because you know, an experiment, yeah, we 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 you know, if, particularly if we're using some new kind of apparatus that we had, aren't familiar with, the experiment might be wrong. And I have in the book a few examples of experiments like that that you know they were really working on the edge of what could be done experimentally, and so to place too much faith in what the experiment seemed to be telling you wouldn't have been the appropriate thing to do in those circumstances. Well, the other side of the Feynman coin is, again, what you began. You said it was an old saw, but you said you began your lecture by saying that Feynman, who knew more about quantum mechanics than anyone in the world, said that no one can possibly understand quantum mechanics. Yeah, well, um, I mean, that was Feynman's take. You know, Feynman was a very practical guy, and he that was part of his persona that I think he created, that, you know, he would do the math. He came up with brilliant math to be able to solve, you know, some of the uh, equations and conundrums of quantum mechanics. Um, and he didn't worry himself too much about what it all really meant. I think a better attitude, to, for my mind, was the one of the, uh, the physicist Niels Bohr, who said, if you think, in effect, if you think you've understood quantum mechanics, then you haven't understood it. And it was Bohr's way of saying, we've really, with quantum mechanics, with, uh, we, we've, we, well, quantum physics, we've really got to be prepared to allow ourselves to be shocked by what it's telling us. If we're not shocked by what it's telling us, then, you know, we haven't understood it because actually what it seems to be telling us really is shocking about what, if you like, what reality really seems to be like. And, you know, the lovely thing uh, about that attitude that Bohr had is that, again, we now have ways to test his way of thinking about quantum mechanics in comparison to, say, Einstein's that we didn't have 
when the two of them were arguing about these things, that these tests, you know, be, they became possible from the 1970s. Now they've been done again and again and again, and they have consistently showed that as far as those two ideas are concerned, Bohr seems to be right and Einstein seems to be wrong. But again, that's just provisional. That's just where we are at the moment. One of the things that I think Einstein did that truncated beauty that turned out to be beauty was when he said the cosmic cosmological constant was the biggest blunder of his life. And in reality, it turned out that it was correct. It well, was, it was it, it, that's a complex story. I mean, it's um that so Einstein, you know, he he found that his um theory of general relativity, when applied to the whole universe, seemed to predict that the universe was expanding. In fact, it was someone else who who, who found that. And first, Einstein thought that um you, you know I, I, Einstein thought this this can't be right, and so he put in this fudge factor, this cosmological right. constant, to make sure the universe wasn't expanding because everyone then believed that was the case. And then we found out quite, you know, only a few years after that, that actually it really is uh, expanding. And so, you know, Einstein realized he didn't have to uh, introduce that, in fact, rather ugly uh, sort of, you know, makeshift answer to his equations that he should have perhaps trusted his, his, his equations, trusted his theory to be telling him the right result. Um, and, uh, you know, now we, we've moved on again and we know that there seems to be the universe seems to be pervaded by this stuff that no one understands called dark energy. And dark energy is causing the universe, not just the universe is expanding, but dark energy is causing it to accelerate as it expands, which is not something that we had anticipated. It's something that observations uh, had shown. And one way of uh, of not exactly explaining that, but of accommodating that within the theory is to reintroduce something like a cosmological logical constant. So in that sense, you know, Einstein was kind of, you could say he was kind of right to, to, to do that, but it's, you know, that's just the way things have fallen out. That cosmological constant that we have today is not exactly the one that Einstein introduced to try to make sense of his theory, but it's another illustration of how, you know, knowledge is contingent and how observations in this case, so in a sense, experimental science, or astronomical observations, uh are the what are the ultimate arbiter of, of the way things are yeah i tend to mythologize people i think that's why i feel the way i do <laughs> but you know going let's go back to some of the experiments because i'm just rambling on one of the ones maybe we could go into is because it's generally considered well not generally but it's considered many times the most beautiful is the messelson stall 1958 um a demonstration of how DNA replicates. And not only is it termed beautiful, but it's also termed, and this is a this is close, that it's elegant. There's mm -hmm. elegance and beauty to it. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's it is that elegance that leads many biologists to say it's their choice for the most beautiful experiment in biology. Um yeah, so so the question uh really that they were addressing, it was um it was known by then um, because uh, James Watson, Francis Crick had shown that DNA has this double helical structure. There are twin strands of this um, this long polymer DNA that wind around each other. And they had seen as soon as they saw that it, that that structure, they realized this is a way for DNA to replicate as it has to do every time a cell divides. The, the, the daughter cells have to have their own copies of DNA. So you have to make copies of this this uh, double helix. And so they realize that it can the strands can come apart and each one has, if you like, the information along it that is needed to template the, the construction of, of another strand. And so, you know, this is this is a mechanism for DNA to replicate. But the question is, how exactly does that replication happen? Um, you know, is it that, you know, each strand comes apart and a new strand is formed on each of them? Or is there some way in which another double helix is formed on the original double helix? Or is it a bit of both? Or do the strands, do they kind of break up and bits of them, you know, get replicated and then they get joined? It wasn't obvious how this happened. And this is what um, uh, Mieselson and Stahl uh, set out to, uh, to to establish, which w w was the case. And uh, the, the way they, they did the, the problem, really, is that once you've got a copy of uh, of, of the strands made, 
it looks identical to what you started with. So how do you tell what was the original strand and what was the copied strand? Um, and there seemed to be no way around this problem because by definition, they're identical. The DNA has been replicated. But what they uh, what they realized is one way to make them different is to use different chemical isotopes. So there are different forms of, um, of every element, actually, every chemical element have different forms called isotopes, which just have slightly different weights to one another. Chemically, they behave identically, but, but one isotope is just heavier than, than another. And so they thought, okay, th this is a way to make the strands different without changing them chemically. We can just make DNA that has but, uh, a, a particular isotope of one of its elements, nitrogen, say, um, in the strands, and then we let it replicate, but we only let it replicate using the normal isotope of or different isotope of nitrogen so that we can then the, the two strands that are made have different weights and there are techniques for separating them according to weight. And then you can figure out, you know, where each of the strands came from. Was it the original one or was it uh, one of the new ones? And so they did this both with with nitrogen isotopes and also DNA has uh, uh, phosphorus atoms along its backbone. Um, so there were you know two ways that they could investigate this this question. And so by doing the experiment this way, they they were able to establish that indeed replication happens as Crick and Watson suspected that actually the whole strand uh, you know, unwinds from the one it's paired with. Another new strand is templated on each of those and those are your new DNA molecules. And so the beauty of that was to you know, they were faced with what seemed to be uh, an irreconcilable problem because you know you had this identity of, of, of strands. And they realized how experimentally you could make them dissimilar. And so you could find out which of these possibilities was the, the real one. And uh, I guess sometimes if you want to, if you look at the polymeric nature of your book, uh, because it is strands, because things lead to other things, and you take the DNA experiment, well, this is the source of life. This explains why we are who we are and why we're made up. But then you go back to a prosaic experiment that kind of leads up to it, which is something as simple and seemingly, okay, why am I doing this? The three-dimensional shape of sugar crystals. Right. Yeah. So how does that link? Does it, is that a link actually, or is it just, would you consider that separate or is all this designed to let the reader I know it's five different questions, but the, is it all designed to lead the reader to some space? It, it's well, I would hope that it, it gives some indication of the the progression of scientific thought, how, you know, yes. one idea leads to another, really. So, I mean, there are there are, you know, a couple there are several exper uh, sort of strands. Uh, to, to to that story. Um, so I'm imagining that you, that there you're talking about going back to Louis Pasteur's observation in the 1840s that there are um, uh, he noticed that uh, this this substance called tartrate, um, which is something that is is found in fermentation, you sort of find crystals of it in wine barrels, and he, he realized that the um, the crystals. Um, come in two different forms that are identical, except that they are mirror images of each other, like our two hands. And he wondered whether the, the these mirror image crystals were a reflection of the fact that the molecules that they're made of, the tartrate molecules, are also mirror images of each other. Um, so that was um, that, that that was what he uh, essentially showed to be the case. It, it sort of came about in a in a slightly different way. It was that people had realized that there were there were these different substances that seemed chemically identical, but they, if you shone light through them, polarized light, the polarized the plane of polarization rotated in opposite ways, and uh, this was really what uh, what Pasteur was trying to was trying to understand. So he, when he realized that there are these two different crystal forms, he, he thought, ah, well, if they are indeed 
these two different mirror image molecules, then all I have to do is separate the, all, I mean, I say all I have to do, it was incredibly painstaking because you had to look through, he had to look through the microscope at these tiny little crystals and separate the left-handed ones from the right-handed ones painstakingly. And then, and then he could look, dissolve each of those separately and see whether indeed, you know, one solution rotated like one way and one solution rotated them the other. And in fact, they did. And so that led him to conclude, and this was actually not something that the experiment itself definitively showed, it was just his hypothesis, that that's because the molecules themselves have these mirror image forms. And that turns out to be the case. And Pasteur thought this must be, be the, the tartrate uh, uh, um, is a compound that's made through fermentation, so it's made by life. And, tart and, and, uh, and, and Pasteur decided that actually maybe all molecules in life have these this handed form maybe they're all like this maybe that is a fundamental principle of life that was a a, 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 a hypothesis that went way beyond any of the experimental data that he had at the time it was pure speculation but it turns out to be pretty much right because dna as you say it, it is a double helix and it's a right-handed uh double helix um so so, so it, it twists around you know there are two ways the screw can twist and dna only twists in one of those ways and we find that actually you know not only dna but also the molecules in our uh, proteins which are the other key component uh, molecular component of our cells they too have this twisted handedness to them so it does turn out to be the case that you know life has this molecular handedness um and you know that was something that was known by the time we uh we came to the structure of dna but the fact that it, it had this this twisted handedness in its double helix was kind of just another affirmation of really this idea that goes back to pasteur so, yeah, I think, it, you know, in that sense, it, there is this lovely sort of continuity of thought with something that happened 100 years earlier fed into the thinking that went into solving the structure of DNA. It's funny because a lot of what has been discovered seems to be almost topological. The handedness, the helix, crystals, crystals play a big part in this. And then those metaphors are what I guess confused a lot of people because it's not only that it's spin it's quarks that are up down charm strange and even the name quark and i think people have a difficult time and scientists have a difficult time explaining it although newspapers have field days with all these things as to what the elements are that we're told they are that this the god is left-handed or right-handed you know someone's spinning that out yeah, well, I mean, science has to rely on metaphor, um, and yeah. it, as, as actually all thinking does. I mean, language is full of metaphor. That's um, the Douglas, Hoff, Douglas Hofstetter. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's part of the way we think. It's a tool for, for, for thinking with. Um, but in science, we're, uh, sometimes we're sort of forced to resort to metaphor because we don't have everyday concepts for what we're talking about. And this this notion of spin in quantum mechanics is one of those. We use the word spin because it looks rather like um, a property that's related to, you know, something spinning round because it has this property called angular particles with spin have this property called angular momentum, which is what you have when you're spinning round. But it doesn't quite work in the way in the, 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 the same way as the sort of classical spin that we're used to. It's slightly different to that. So it's not really clear, um, you know, exactly what these these quantum objects are doing when they have spin, whether they're really, you know, we can really think of them as spinning round or not. So in a sense, spin there is a metaphor, but it's one, you know, we, we absolutely have to have something like that. When it comes to, you, you mentioned quarks, which are the subatomic particles um, that make up the the nucleons, the protons and neutrons in our um, in, the, in our atomic nuclei. Um, there, we've kind of gone beyond even those kind of classical, you know, uh, metaphors. And so people talk about quarks as having different colors. Um, and, you know, this isn't, they're not literally colored. Color has no meaning uh, at that scale. Um, it's just, a, 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 it, you know, it's just a term that, that is used to, dis, to, 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 to talk about the fact that there are these three types of, uh, of, of quarks. 
Um, and, you know, we might as well call them that as anything else. And so, you know, we give them these labels of up and down and top and bottom and beauty. Uh, beauty is interesting. Beauty and charm. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, at that level, the metaphors that we have to use, they're, they're very abstract. They're purely metaphorical. But often when we're talking about something like how, how life works, how these molecules, proteins and DNA work, you know, biologists use metaphors all the time to uh, of metaphors of uh, greater or lesser aptness, I should say. But nevertheless, they're still, you know, essential tools for thinking about what those molecules are doing. One, I guess one of, well, you, it's good that one of the ask one of the experiments, you know, you're talking about carbon and it's kind of a reverse metaphor because what we're talking about is Buckminster Fuller range. So you have Buck, Buckminster Fuller creating the template for what was sub subsequently discovered tell that story yeah yeah i mean you know that that's the lovely way that sometimes you know the the wider world sort of feeds back into science not just as a metaphor actually but actually for informing thinking so what th this is about a new form of carbon that was discovered in 1985 uh by a team working at rice university in houston in houston um with uh, a, a british scientist uh, as part of the team and um the, the, this was a form of carbon that consists of cage-like molecules. They're, they look like soccer balls, um, and it's made purely of carbon and precisely of 60 carbon atoms joined together in such a way that they form a kind of spherical hollow cage. This was a kind of carbon that no one had, had imagined before. We, previously, we knew that there was diamond as one form of carbon and there was graphite as another form and they have different uh chemical they have different molecular structures um and those were understood but no one had anticipated the, the, the this kind of ball form of carbon and when the scientists um discovered that they had made these apparently these uh, 60 atom molecules of pure carbon they were thinking well how how can you join 60 carbon atoms together so that you don't have kind of loose edges or anything and they were scratching their heads to figure out what what structure this could possibly have um and uh, the british scientist harry croto um uh, he was kind of thinking about it that evening and he had a, a strong interest in architecture and he knew of this work that uh, the the architect uh, Richard uh, Buckminster Fuller had had done making these geodesic domes um, that were basically made by joining together um, hexagons, hexagonal patches uh in a sort of tiling pattern but buckminster fuller had uh realized that if you just join together hexagons it, it you get no curvature you just get a flat sheet if you put pentagons in there just a few pentagons that creates the curvature and you know and and so harry croto was was casting his mind back to that and and he realized you've got to have pentagons in there if you put pentagons and hexagons which basically means rings of six carbon atoms and five carbon atoms uh, if you join those together, you can make these domes that that curve, you know, the most perfect of them that's like a sphere curves into uh, a sort of ball shape with precisely 60 carbon atoms. And so that was how he figured out, you know, what structure these uh, molecules must have. They didn't have any proof of that at that stage. They put that forward as, a, as an idea in, in 1985. And it wasn't until five years later that scientists figured out how to make enough of this stuff, this C60, um, to, to that they could make crystals of it and actually figure out what the structure is, where the atoms are, and they confirmed the idea. Um, so, you know, it was absolutely that. It was the fact that that Harry knew that, um, you know, he knew of this 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 work from uh, Buckminster Fuller that informed the way he he thought about this problem. And in fact, the, they, they christened the C60 molecules Buckminster Fullerene for that reason. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that you there is this backbiting and uh, credit aspect of science and you talk about people who might have won the nobel prize people who are slighted and particularly the women who were not given the credit that they should have been given or even have won the nobel prize just talk about one or two of those situations yeah well you know it is um uh, uh it, it's too much of a recurrent theme 
in science for it to be pure chance that um, I mean many people have been passed over and haven't given been given the due the credit they're due but it seemed to happen so much to female scientists you know certainly in the in the um, uh, early and later 20th century that you know you have to suspect what was uh, what was happening there I mean one of the most notorious cases that I don't dis talk about in the book was the discovery of pulsars these um, neutron stars that are you know sending out regular sort of pulses of of, uh, of 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 radio waves, and this was a discovery made by uh, uh, um, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell when she was a, uh, a graduate student at Cambridge, working with Anthony Hewish, um, and in the 1960s. So she was the one who made the observations and spotted these things, and you know realized that there was something peculiar about them. Um, but when it came to getting the Nobel Prize for this hugely important discovery, it was Hewish who got it and, and not uh, Bell Burnell. And she has always been incredibly graceful about that. I mean, uh, you know, unbelievably so. But there's no question in anyone's mind that uh, were that to happen today, she would have got the Nobel Prize and she really should have done then. But the one that one of the ones that I did, I mean, I should I, I can't go without mentioning Rosalind Franklin, who was, um, you know, key to uh, uh, a key part in the discovery of the structure of, of DNA. Again, it's not uh, a, a, a thing that I talk about in the book itself. Um, she was the one who did the the, the analysis of um, the crystallography work that uh, helped Watson and Crick come to the conclusions that they did. Um, and, you know, it's often said that she should have won the Nobel Prize, it was stolen from her and so on, and the results were stolen. The real story is much more complex than that. And in fact, you know, very sadly, uh, Rosalind Franklin died uh, of cancer before the others got the Nobel Prize anyway, so it never really became an issue. Um, that was really why, um, you know, she, she wasn't awarded it. Well, if she had still been alive, it's, it's still a, you know, it's a question whether she would have been honoured or not. Um, but one of the ones I do uh, talk about in the book is um, the discovery of it, it, this is a, a, another difficult concept, but it's again related to hand in, handedness. It's the discovery of what's called parity violation. Um, so whether the fundamental laws of physics are themselves uh, themselves are um, symmetrical uh, 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 with respect to changing a left to a right. And everyone had assumed that's called uh, that's called parity conservation. If if they are, if you can take the, those laws of physics and just you know t turn t t take turn the left into a right and they look the same, then that's parity conservation. And the, the, uh, it was uh, suggested in the late 1950s by two Chinese born scientists that maybe there are cases where this is violated. That actually nature if you like, you know, it's left handed. It has a it makes a distinction between left and right. So this was an idea that was suggested and almost immediately um, it was tested experimentally uh, by Chen Cheng Wu, who was a female scientist um, working, if I remember rightly, at Columbia. And um, she figured out, you know, you, a way to test this idea, looking at radioactive decay. Um, and it was uh, a, it was a very you know elegant uh, uh, way to to look at what seemed to be a very abstract idea. And um, she did the experiments in 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 collaboration with others. Um, but but Chen Chen was 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 uh, absolutely the person who was driving you know these experiments along. And indeed, they confirmed that um, uh, the parity was violated in this case, that nature can tell left from right. And the Nobel Prize went to the two scientists who proposed that idea in the first place um, and not to Wu, who actually did the experimental work to show that it was so. And, you know, to my mind, that makes no sense whatsoever uh, not to recognize that the, it was experimental work that you know otherwise this would have just been pure speculation this really showed uh that, that that was the case so i think it's very clear that wu should have shared that nobel prize with the other two why she didn't is a subject of speculation no one really knows but i think that you know that's a classic uh injustice that people recognize today it must be so disappointing for someone to die just before they get the nobel prize <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I mean, in a sense, I suppose you can see that it's disappointing for for others. I mean, Rosalind Franklin died um, some years before they uh, that she she would have you know been been up for 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 the prize. Um, but uh, but you know, it it does happen. It happens in other cases. There are also cases where people you know live just long enough to get the prize. So John Goodenough, the um, the, the the chemist who was responsible for you know a huge part of the work on lithium rechargeable lithium batteries uh he got that he's the el eldest person to ever to have been given the nobel prize it was three or four years ago i forget exactly when um for his work on this and he was i think about you know, i think he was 99 at the time people have been saying for years he should be he should get the nobel prize for this incredibly important work and people were really worried that it wasn't going to happen in his lifetime he lived just long enough to get it and i'm so pleased that he did yeah and then higgs getting it and i guess crying um not necessarily crying because he got it but crying because what he had thought all his life had been proven to be true so you, you talk about cern but i'm jumping around but cern is an amazing compared to the stick in the sand it's just absolutely amazing but the other one and perhaps the most amazing image that people will find in the book is uh, the individual atoms forming the uh, name of the company, IBM, in the tunneling uh, electron microscope. Talk about that, because it's amazing. It's amazing to look at. It 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 absolutely is. Um, and th this was one of my favorite experiments, not least because, and actually I, I should, for the record, just m make it clear that I, I'm not uh, an editor of Nature any longer. I was for a long time, but, I, but I'm not any oh, longer. Okay. I wouldn't be able to write these books if I was doing that job too. Um, but I raised that here because this was a paper that I handled while I was an editor at Nature back in the 90s. Um, and uh, so it was a paper done by researchers, by Don Eigler uh, um, and, and colleagues at uh, IBM's research centre in Almaden in, in, uh, in San Jose. And uh, they they used this a relatively new as what well, then a relatively new instrument called the scanning tunneling microscope which is a way uh it's a microscope that is able to see individual atoms and you 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 have this very very fine metal tip that you bring close to a surface and when the tip gets close enough to the surface if it's the surface of a metal or something that conducts electricity then electrons can jump between the tip and the surface and you can and that creates a tiny little current that you can measure and if the tip comes a little bit away from the surface then if it's a bit further then the that current drops dramatically and so it's very sensitive to the distance between the the tip and the surface and so that you can actually as you scan the tip across the surface you can see the little bumps due to atoms stacked there like eggs in an egg carton and so you can get an image of uh, the, uh, the of the surface at the atomic scale. So this uh, instrument had been invented in the 1980s, and I discussed that in in, in the book. But then what um, uh, Don Eigler and his colleagues realized was that you can actually use the tip not just to see atoms, but but to push them around because there's a very small force um, that exists between the tip and the and the surface. And if you've got an atom sitting uh, sort of say a gas atom that's just got sort of stuck to uh, the surface and is sitting there on top, then you can use the tip just to nudge it along. And they, they did this work gently nudging uh, the atoms around until they had been able to, to, to nudge, uh, I think it was 35 atoms of, of xenon, the, the rare gas, on the surface of a metal. They nudged them just in, in place to form in a sort of dot matrix to form the letters IBM, the company they worked for. And this, this was an iconic image for nanotechnology at the time. Um, and I still find it astonishing that, you know, that this is possible, that we can not just see atoms, but can position them one by one with this sort of precision. Yeah, and it's uh, talking about the progression and two other instances, you talk about the scientists taking their daughter's hair to use as a fine point, which is so much bigger than the point we were just discussing. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, that was uh, so this was um, something that was this was work that was um, done uh, by. Well, it was if I remember rightly, it was Hans Speyman, um, uh looking at um, 
uh, looking at uh, at uh, cells uh, dividing dur during embryogenesis. He was he was trying to understand how where the form comes from, and he was uh, looking at ways of separating individual cells. They could see the cells under the microscope, but you know how you uh, how how do you sort of manipulate them to you know to be able to separate cells in an em in an embryo? And he yeah used the very fine hair from his you know infant daughter's head um to uh to uh, as as a kind of little tourniquet to separate the cells this way and it was a lovely example of how um scientists sometimes often have to just improvise with whatever they have um you know that this is i mean this is actually the, the same was true for the scanning tunneling microscope that now you know these days they're they're very sort of sophisticated devices that are made by companies but the first one was cobbled together again from whatever bits the scientists had around you know and they they uh, uh, they didn't know whether it would work and in fact people told them it wouldn't work you know how on earth are you going to have this great metal tip coming to a surface and actually see individual atoms it wasn't clear that it would and they just kind of improvised and made this thing that looks like you know the kind of thing you'd assemble down in your sort of cellar you know just tinkering around and, it's, and in fact that's what it was but they did it with enough precision, enough skill that this device did actually do what they hoped it would. I could, I could go through every experiment, but we'd be here for another three hours. So I guess in conclusion, although I don't really want to, um, something I touched on before. So I know how I respond to this book. What would you think in all your books, actually, what do you like the reader to take away from this book? To go out and discover more, to recognize beauty in this, and then extrapolate to other things in nature and perhaps even human behavior. There's, or is there is? I mean, I don't like I, novels and and books where you close the book and you're done. They don't sometimes interest me. But this book, this book again. Here's the cover. This book, you know, I closed it, but I'm not done with it, and I won't be done with it for a while. Is that something that you? like i i really hope so i mean i think you know what perhaps one of the um the attractions of this book is that you don't have to read it sit down and read it from cover to right. cover you dip into it because each experiment is self-contained uh although you know as we've talked about they hopefully sort of build up you know over the course of them but you can read each one in a self-contained way and they're just two or three pages long um and you know it will tell a story you will learn something from it but i what i really hope most of all is that this is seen as a kind of testament to human ingenuity um that you know how we have throughout time asked uh, posed a question about the world and then thought hmm, how can i actually go out and find out whether that is true or not how can i do an experiment to do this um and that's what came across to me as i was researching this just the incredible ingenuity that went be it went into these experiments i just find it it's so inspiring that you know as well as being able to think up complex ideas like quantum mechanics and relativity and so on we have this practical ingenuity that allows us to actually go and build stuff and you know do stuff to find out if those ideas are true i think that's an excellent summary and i could go back into other guy you know i always say concluding and then i don't conclude but you could go back into the curies and the, the rigor and the time and then actually their lives um all right, that's it. <laughs> this has been <laughs> this has been lovely, Philip. Thank you so much for doing this. I've learned so much and I really enjoy talking to you. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Okay.